Hello, this is Rico Cavellia. I, I want to welcome you to this episode of the Fearless Aging Podcast, where in every episode, my guests and I, we strive to offer you proven tips and strategies that you can implement immediately to greatly improve your overall health and well-being. So we're here to inspire you and empower you to become your best self so you can go out and make a bigger positive difference in the world. And I want you to know I'm really excited about this episode because we are going to learn what the latest science says about how aging works, how we can reverse aging, and the prospects for curing aging diseases. I don't know what can be more interesting and important than that. So before I introduce our expert guest, if you've been wondering how well you are aging, well, I've got the solution for you. Go to our main website, agelesslivinglifestyle.com, take our aging assessment, and if you don't like the, your results, you can book a call with me, free call, and we'll discuss what health and wellness and fitness and premature aging challenges you're having, and I'll do my best to give you some proven quick tips and strategies that you can implement immediately. So go to agelesslivinglifestyle.com and take our aging assessment. So our guest today is Dr. Michael Fossil. He is the chairman of the board of Telesite, a biotech firm targeting Alzheimer's disease, intending to begin FDA-sponsored human trials aimed at curing the underlying disease process using telomerase therapy. He has authored more than 100 articles and chapters and books on aging, medicine, and ethics, and he has lectured globally, including at the National Institute of Health in, 19, in 2020 uh, on his article on the causes of Alzheimer's and dementia. So, Dr. Michael, thanks so much for being here. Hey, my pleasure. Glad to see you, Rico. Yeah. Everybody enjoys having somebody talk about aging with the last name Fossil, too. That always <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absolutely. So, uh, I, I, as we were talking before we came on the air here, I, I've, I've looked, I've read through a lot of your stuff and, and, and some of your of your book that we'll talk about too, and your, all your papers and things. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to say that we're really on the same page, and I really thank you for the great work you're doing. And I just want to say, you know, I have a signature. I have a signature t a talk, and the, the and the title of it is the bi the biggest challenge that we as humanity are facing is becoming old and sick and dying way too young. And I think you really ag will agree with that. I do. <laughs> you know, a total waste of humanity to see people die. Oh, oh, absolutely. Think about all the experience and the knowledge and hopefully the wisdom that we accumulate over the decades, and then we bury it. You know, I was just going to say that. So good. I was just going to say, I, I, before we get into it, I, I want our audience to know that there's the reason that this is so important and you need to pay attention and stay with us and learn what you can about it. It's not just for for the obvious benefit of your personal life, but as, as you said, Michael, uh, as we age, you know, we gain knowledge and wisdom. And mm -hmm. we need to, we need more people to stay healthy and energetic as they age, so they can give back this knowledge and wisdom to help solve these monumental challenges that we are facing as humanity these days. And also, I, I think we need you know we're sorely lacking in in uh, elders you know in role models and mentors for younger people. So so that's another big reason why you need to. To, to learn how to how to take care of yourself and how to age better, how to reverse all this stuff, so you can be here longer and uh, I say be mentors and role models for younger people. I think you're right, and I think it's doable, actually. Yeah, no question about it. So my first question for you is, how did you get to start a study in aging? Hmm. I started in medical school. It was sort of an odd story. I was doing a PhD in, in neurobiology. And they actually paid me to go to medical school because they wanted me to teach some of the courses, which was fine by me. Oh, um, yeah. And I was originally working in the development of the nervous system, which I find absolutely awe-inspiring. Um, sort of like looking at the Milky Way at night. It just, it's, it's just you, you really feel small compared to the universe. But I felt the same way about the development of the nervous system. But I found that when I talked about the way the nervous system ages and the rest of the body ages, people... Um, we're very cavalier about it. You know, their idea was it just happens. Things fall apart. You rust, wear and tear, entropy. And they use these essentially buzzwords, not totally inaccurate buzzwords, but buzzwords. Um, and they would assume nothing was really going on. It was interesting. 
And I find that whenever people get that sort of cavalier, it usually means there's more to it. Like anything in life, it's, there's usually a lot more complexity than we realize. And so I began to dig into it. And I, what I found was that there were a lot of uh, options, a lot of uh, alleys you could go down, but they didn't seem to connect. It was sort of the blind man and the elephant. There were clearly an ear and a tail and a trunk and a, a leg, but where's the elephant? Mm -hmm. uh, example, progeria. Example, uh, mitochondrial aging. Example, um, some of the, 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 gly the glycation changes. The question is, all right, that's true, but what are they, how do they go together? Um, and for me, it wasn't until the mid-90s or early 90s, actually, when I first ran into something that began to put it together, and that had to do with cell aging. Um, first described by a friend of mine, Len Hayflick, who just died earlier this year. Mm -hmm. I will miss Len uh, in 1961. And then some of the original work done by another friend of mine who just died last year, uh, Cal Hartley. I was the chief scientist at Jared, probably the earliest of the uh, biotech companies working on aging out in California. Um, and they invited me out to look at some of their research, and I was absolutely stunned. Um, if anybody says, can we ever reverse aging? The answer was, it was first done in 1998 in human cells in the laboratory, uh, and then in human tissues in the year 2000. The question is, can we do it to animals or to humans? And that's an interesting question. The answer is almost certainly yes, but can we manage to pull it off? I think where we are is a lot like where we were in 1903 with regard to powered flight. We have demonstrated we can get powered flight. You can reverse aging. But that's not the same as taking a 747 across the Atlantic Ocean with people at 30,000 mm -hmm. feet in safety at hundreds of miles an hour. <clears throat> We're just getting to that point. Yeah, there's very de varying degrees of, of, of how, how we can progress with that. Well, I, I, I mean, there's no question that, that right now, as, as you well know, and I think most people know, you know, you know right now in America, we're we're not doing very well at all. We're not even ranked in the in the top twenty in the world for for longevity, and we're not we're definitely not aging very well as all. And and as you well know too, I mean, we know now that that the science tells us that our, our genetic potential is to stay healthy to about one hundred and twenty five at least, right? Well, I think it's the at least that confuses people. I think people okay. assume that that can't be changed, and it's true historically that we have uh, you know at least tripled the mean human lifespan, mm -hmm. but we haven't affected the maximum human lifespan of, as you say, 120, 125, whatever it is, around there. Um, but I think we can. I think we can unpin that. And that's what the data has shown over the past two, almost three decades. Um, we're just, we just need to, to be able to work on it a little better and get over people's preconceptions about this. You know, it, back to powered flight, I'm reminded that in, in 1895, the world's leading physicist, Lord Kelvin, said we will never have heavier than air flight. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Eight years later, is proving more. <laughs> yeah. and, and I think a lot of people, and you've seen some of these articles out recently too, saying you really cannot change the maximum human lifespan. To the contrary, we yeah. clearly can. The question is, are we technically able to do this in safety? I think the right. answer is yes, but it takes some doing. Yeah, and the, and as as you mentioned too, I mean, there's some ethics involved too, and some uh, ideas. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later too. I want to get your your input on that as well. So, well, let's talk about the aging process and what the latest science shows. Uh, how the uh, what is the aging process and what are some of the main factors in aging? Well, you know, as I said, when I <clears throat> really got intrigued by it back fifty years ago, um, if most people, if you ask them what aging is, they'd say, "Well, it's entropy. It's just things fall apart." What you expect, and I see this this still as a common um, unexamined assumption. Mm -hmm. um, people just assume that things fall apart. Now, clearly, there's more to it than that. Example, if I ask how old you are, the answer is a certain number of decades. Me too. I'm 73 going on 74. A uh, certain number of decades. Um, and if you think about it, you're a little older than that, probably nine months older because you were you know, in the uterus before that. But your cell came from your mother. The main ovum came from your mother. And that was at least several decades old when, when it was fertilized. So you're at least not a couple of decades, but she got it from her mother who got it from her mother. And in fact, every cell in your body is about 4.2 billion years old. That's the latest <laughs> figure, whether you believe it or not. And, yeah. and as I sometimes jokingly say, most of us look pretty good for 4.2 billion years. <laughs> yeah. But the point I'm making is that clearly life has been around despite entropy for a long time. 
So the question isn't why do we age? It's why do we age sometimes and not other times? Why do we age at different rates? Why do dogs age faster than we do? Why do some animals age more slowly than we do? It's not, you can't simply wave your hands and say, wear and tear, entropy, things fall apart without explaining why they fall apart at different rates of different species and in different cells at different times. And again, in some cells, at least retrospectively, not at all. Again, the provenance of your cells is 4 billion years. So you can't simply say entropy because then none of us would have been here after 4 billion, Four billion years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's more to it than that. It's more complex. It's more mysterious. And that's where people aren't thinking. They just say, well, everything ages. Everything doesn't age. Everything ages at the same rate. Everything doesn't age at the same rate. Um, we don't think more, more deeply about this, about the complexities involved. But once you do, you begin to realize something can be done about it. Yeah, well, well, and thanks to people like yourself who, who, who do delve into that. Let me ask this question. Is this true? I, I, I think I remember hearing quite a long time ago that, that someone did an experiment once where they, I forget what kind of a cell it was, but they kept some kind of a, some cells in a test, in a little petri glass in a laboratory. I think it was a heart. I think it was a heart. And they kept on, you know, get, you know, get feeding what it needed, give it the oxygen, the food, get rid of the waste products, and they, they said, and they kept it alive indefinitely for a really long period of time. Because so, in other words, a cell could live, a, 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 a certain uh, molecule or a cell could live indefinitely if it given the right nutrients and get rid of the waste products and, and keep it in that perfect environment, it, it, ne it would never die. Was that true? That's one of those things that's. Partly true and very much false. Uh, and oh. the very much false has to do with the, the way the experiment was done with, with chicken heart cells. Oh, chicken um, heart, yeah, okay. Yeah, and this was, you know, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And, and um, the problem was, and this is back to Len Hayflick, who, who first said, you know, it, it's funny, I, I keep trying to re repeat that experiment. And I can't get it done. Oh. It looks like what was happening was that prior to that, and again, not to speak ill of the people who did that by name, but what they were doing was taking a, some chicken cells in broth, and then every day they'd add fred, fresh broth to feed those chicken cells, but as it turns out, they were adding fresh chicken cells. So oh, of course, oh, they, like yeah. they lasted forever. So what, <laughs> oh, yeah. Len, what Len did is he was very uh, careful. He took those chicken cells and he said, let's make sure I don't put any other cells in it. We'll fresh broth every day. And what he found is that they divide a typical number of times, call it 30 times, and then they'd, they'd slow down as they got to that point and it stopped dividing. So what he found was that, quote, all cells age and divide, except for certain cells, like the germ cell, again, the ovum from your mother, the sperm from your father, um, and certain other cells, as some of the stem cells, and in some cases, cancer cells, a slightly different issue. So all somatic cells in our bodies show aging over time and have a limited number of replications. And yet, in retrospect, the germ cell line has been going for 4 billion years without a glitch. Well, actually, so, there have been a lot of glitches, but those cells died, and you and I are the result of cells that didn't have those glitches. And so fact, what? There have been problems too, you know, and mutations. Otherwise, we'd all still be slime molds, which we're not. So yeah, so, change, but life goes on. So why do you, I think there is if if there is a limited amount of of times that, that a cell can can divide and reproduce? What what, what causes that? Do you think? Well, it has to do actually with with the changing uh, pattern of gene expression. Um, the analogy I sometimes use is a symphony orchestra. You know, the if I take uh, somebody's playing Mozart and it kind of knock music, and then the next day the same orchestra is placed, playing a, an atonal John Cage piece, the difference is not that the piano is now out of tune, the first violinist is incompetent, the oboe reeds are broken, the strings are broken on the cello. No, that's not it. They're playing a different score, but it's the same set of instruments. The same is really going on with our cells. You know, the difference between cells in my brain and the cells in my toes is not that they have different genes, mostly, but that they, they're playing a different tune on those genes, different epigenetic pattern. Mm -hmm. But the same is true about the difference between me at age seven and me at age, now at age 73. It's not that I have different genes, mostly. It's that I'm playing a different pattern on the same genes. I'm playing, as it were, John Cage rather than Mozart. So the question is, can we reset that pattern can we change the orchestration? And the answer is yes. The, the orchestra pattern, the, the score, appears to be set by the telomere. Now, it's true that all of the instruments in the orchestra, the genes, the epigenetic pattern, are absolutely critical. But the question is, how can we best reset the orchestra from John Cage to Mozart? The answer is not by going around to each and every instrument, 
by resetting the score that the orchestra leading is is leading. You know, what are they playing? Um, so it, the difference between young cells and old cells has to do with the pattern of gene expression and the way things are turned over. Uh, but that set, it's orchestrated, if you were, well, by the telomere, largely. Oh, okay. For, 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 so, so for our, our audience, let, let, talk about what what a telomere is and and, and how it operates and, and why it, it does begin to shorten. Yeah, the, the telomere is the last several thousand base pairs at the end of in the end of your your chromosomes, and for reasons that are kind of interesting, first described by a friend of mine, Alexei Alabnikov, uh, back in seventy one, um, and then by James Watson a year later, but. Watson did it in the English literature and Alexei did it in the Russian literature, which nobody in the West reads. But he explained why it is that they naturally shorten. And it has to do with the way that the DNA replicates. But the outcome is that every time your cells divide, part of that end of your chromosome gets a little shorter. And over time, as that shortens, that has an effect on gene expression throughout the rest of your cells, rest of the chromosomes in your cells. And the outcome of that is interesting, but it has to do with the turnover rates and replacement rates of parts and cells and and molecules throughout the body. For example, DNA repair enzymes, for example, mitochondrial enzymes, uh, for example, um, amyloid in the brain around microglia and neurons. The, the turnover rate goes down. So you still make normal proteins, normal enzymes, normal lipids, but you're making them and turning them over, recycling them at a slower rate. Uh, I'll give you a different example of this. You know, if, if you look at the, the collagen in my skin, Mm -hmm. The collagen in my skin, some people assume that what happens is you get breaks in the collagen and therefore you get wrinkles. There's labial folds, wrinkles in the skin and so on. But that's looking at it in a static point of view. It is not true that you simply start with a certain amount of collagen in your face and over 70 years, it becomes broken. No, it's entirely being turned over on a daily basis, hourly basis. <laughs> and, but the rate of turnover goes down with age so that the wrinkles begin to accumulate, the damage begins to accumulate. But it's not simply a passive process. It's a slowing down of maintenance. So what aging really is, is a balance between entropy and maintenance. Entropy is always there. And maintenance is always sufficient over 4 billion years. But over your in your somatic cells, you begin to turn down the maintenance process and entropy begins to win. So, so why does that happen? Why does the maintenance slow down as we age? Well, you could ask that in several ways. You could ask it, what is the process? Or you could ask the teleological question of, why, why is there aging at all, which is another mm -hmm. interesting one to get into. Yeah. But it, it the process itself for me, I'd have to stress that in some sense, I'm going to be facetious about this. I don't care what the process is. What I want to know is where is the single most effective point of intervention clinically and financially? Mm -hmm. um, now, to answer that question, I need to understand the process. And the process is remarkably complex. I addressed this in the <laughs> recent textbook I just put out with Academic Press. Um, but it's remarkably complex process. But again, the, the key question is, that's nice, but where can we intervene? So for example, you could intervene at the level of Yamanaka, Yamanaka factors or methylation or acetylation or, or the end proteins or upstream, you could change some genes. But all of those tend to be sort of, let um, me put this, uh, inefficient. Again, that would be like going to the orchestra, replacing the violinist and the oboe reed and the mm -hmm. piano. No, a more efficient way to do that is simply change the orchestration. And that's what's been done in the lab. And that's what's actually now been done in animals. The question is, can we take it to human trials? So we're going to start with Alzheimer's for strategic reasons, but really it applies to all age-related diseases. And fundamentally, what we're looking at is reversing the aging process in people. Okay. Well, before we get into that, I, I, I like how you make that analogy, the, the orchestration, how you change the orchestration. I just have a question. Okay, so... So, so originally, that's how we were set up. I mean, that's how our, our physical bodies were designed by however, however you we, you believe the creator or whoever created us, how it was made. If as the cells divide, you, a little bit of the, uh, of the telomeres they lose, a, they shorten up. So, so that that was the natural way of it. That that's the way it was made to be. So, so I'm just I'm trying to understand if, if, if that's just the way is maybe that's the way it's supposed to be, and 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 maybe I don't know if it's, maybe we shouldn't be trying to change that. What do you think about that? Well, it depends uh, whether you're looking at things from the standpoint of the species and evolution, or the standpoint of you and I personally. Okay. You know, the the uh, here's an example: um, mutations. 
we tend to, you and I think of mutations oh. as bad things because they may cause cancer, for example. And you and I have no interest in dying of cancer because of some mutation that we got in the cosmic brain. No interest. Right. Right. On the other hand, um, from a biological perspective, a certain degree of mutation is very useful. It mm -hmm. gives uh, it gives some innovation and chance to play around with new things and, and adapt to an adaptation. So, for example, let's say that the oxygen level on this planet drops or the temperature goes up, global warming or anything else happens. Anytime there's a change in our environment, whether biological, geological or otherwise, we need to adapt to that. You mm -hmm. can't adapt without mutation. So to a degree, mutations are useful. From us, from our personal standpoint, the answer is no, they're not. But mm -hmm. on a broader scale, yes, they are, because they give your great, 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 great grandchildren a chance to uh, be adapted to something that you and I wouldn't have otherwise been adapted to. And if you think about different organisms, it, it depends on um, how fast they adapt. So a very small organism, take a bacteria, adapts very, very quickly because the cycling time is fast. A very big organism, dinosaur, for example, um, couldn't adapt to changes very, very fast. Uh, yeah. So let me give you an analogy of this. Let's say we have two islands. And in, in both islands, we have a population of deer. A couple of thousand deer on this, a couple of thousand deer on this one. And the first one has a lifespan of a year. Each deer lives a year. They reproduce fast. The other one has a lifespan of 100 years. Now, <clears throat> let's change the environment. And let's make it that their favorite food is, is changing. And it's becoming a little more toxic as the plants adapt. The, the lifespan of, of one year, those animals will adapt very quickly to the change in the environment. Those of 100 years won't. So the short lifespan is more likely to survive in the long run than the long lifespan. On the other hand, for human beings, as an example, um, there's an advantage in having a long lifespan. It gives us a chance to accumulate information, knowledge, understanding of our environment, and pass it on to our children and grandchildren. Also, you and I aren't eager to die at age 10. Right. Um, but <laughs> yeah. what I'm getting at is, in a broader perspective, there's a balance. Lifespan's short, lifespan's long. It's not as simple as good or bad. It's a matter of, you know, long-term survival of a species, yeah. rather than the long-term survival of you and I. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so what I'm I'm kind of hearing that that's kind of the way it it is set up in our in order for us to survive on a longer time of basis. I mean, that's why, um, you know, maybe it's, it's not such a good idea to try to extend our life for too long. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know either. And, and there are lots of parts that let me look at it biologically for a second. If we're just looking at it biologically, never mind human culture and our interests, and, mm -hmm. and um, then it would be better in some sense to have shorter lifespans. We can adapt faster. Um, but on the other hand, human beings are just starting to set set out on a path that no other organism has, which is the ability to alter our, our own organism, our DNA. Mm -hmm. So let's say that our environment changes we theoretically have the potential to step in and change our genes to correspond to that. Uh, take something simple, the temperature. You know, we could adjust our body's genetic engineering, adjust it to deal with higher temperatures or lower oxygen or you name it. Um, so that's a new thing. The idea that we might be able to live longer, which could be a disadvantage from a species, is sort of balanced against this ability to adapt ourselves to changing environments. For that matter, living on on Mars, you know, um, it, we can think of all sorts of things that might potentially be doable that uh, uh, allow you to sort of obviate the need for simple evolution when we can evolve ourselves intentionally, which brings up all sorts of ethical issues as well. It's complicated. Don't let me don't let me suggest. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. Matter. it's not. It, it is, it is not, complicated. It's, it's not as simple as good or bad. It's a matter of it, there are a lot of pro, pros and cons of these things. Yeah, yeah, there's there's lots of different aspects of thinking of it. Well, just like the term quantum physics, which doesn't that mean, from my understanding, quantum means multidimensional. As, as we're learning, there's so much more dimensions to our, our universe than we first thought. There's multidimensions. So maybe that's another reason that we need to be around longer so we can we can learn how to how to tune into you know, and raise our our consciousness and, and, and be able to connect more with the the quantum universe an outcome devoutly to be wished <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh see what else i wanted to say i wanted to ask you before we get into a little bit more particulars was uh okay so, so well then then well obviously if we can learn how to how to how to 
cure some of these diseases that are aging us, you know, such as we all know, cancer and diabetes and heart disease and all these things. So that's that's got to be a good thing. So we can live a have a again, as you mentioned, the most important thing is to have a, a long health span, lifespan. That's something, you know, who knows? But we, we want to have a good health span. But so, so but, but let's 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 really talk about now what we you know, what you what you guys are planning to, what you you say you, you guys are planning to, some human trials at curing the underlying diseases process. So let's talk about that and, and talk about your telomerase therapy. What what is that? What we're going to do is, um, as I say, the, the the key question is what's the most effective point of intervention. So, for example, with Alzheimer's disease. Theoretically, I could change your ApoE4 gene to an ApoE2 gene upstream, upstream risk factors. Or I could make sure you don't have head injuries or don't expose to radiation or avoid toxins. We go on and on about upstream risk factors, and they have a limited impact. And we can talk about downstream outcomes, for example, beta amyloid plaque, tau tangles, uh, a lot of things that we would like to work on. But the question still is, in between there, what goes from upstream risk factors to downstream risk factors, and where is the single optimal point to step in and change things? Mm -hmm. And rather than just change, just beta amyloid, just taut tangles, just a million other things, mitochondrial dysfunction, lipid turnover, a lot of things, is there a more effective point of intervention? Well, it looks from, there's an article I put out that the editors call the most important paper they've ever published on Alzheimer's. And what we're saying is, yes, there's a way to go from upstream risk factors to downstream outcomes, and there are points of intervention that are probably far more effective than anything else. And it's now within our technical ability to intervene. Uh, and the most effective point probably is the telomere itself. And as I say, we've known since 1998 that we can reset that and we do the cells act younger. And we've known now for more than a dozen years that we are within limits capable of doing that in animals, particularly mice. Uh, and the question is, can we do it with humans? And there's some suggestive evidence that we can do it in humans as easily as we can do it in mice. So we'll take that to human trials. Um, what we're going to do is uh, see if we can actually reset cellular aging within the human brain in neurons, glial cells, and so on, uh, to show that we can actually reset the process of Alzheimer's. You know, we're not talking about slowing Alzheimer's or even stopping it. We're talking about being able to reset it, that is, uh, to essentially cure it within limits. You know, it's, there's got to be what I used to call Humpty Dumpty phenomena. Sometimes the egg is broken and you can't put it back together again. Mm -hmm. Or if I, if a, to use another analogy, you know, if your hard drive really has been fried by a hammer multiple times, I can't put it together again. But if it's a little glitch, we can fix it. The question is, how much can we fix of an Alzheimer's brain? And I think quite a bit. Uh, well, uh, uh, so, so, so what are some of the, uh, what are some of the strategies for fixing it? Well, there are a number of them. And, and again, I address this in the, the second to last chapter of my book because there are a lot of theoretical concerns and unknowns still. Um, but uh, one way to do that would be to take a human telomerase gene, which is in your body, but it's essentially turned off mostly, um, and put that gene into the same cells uh, in your brain so that it temporarily, transiently expresses telomerase, which resets telomere length, which resets the epigenetic pattern, which resets cell function, which resets Alzheimer's. Mm. Again, it's complicated. Um, yeah. And we know it can be done, again, within limits. The question is, how good are we at it? it? Again, back to the 1903 analogy, we know you can have powered flight. How long can you fly? How high can you fly? How safe is it? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot still to be answered, but we know powered flight's possible. We know that we can reset gene expression in human cells. Yeah. Uh, what about you know? The, there's always some things out there. You, you, um, you know, like what, the, the, the you know the product TA65. Uh, mm. All this. Are they claim that that they can 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 lengthen your telomeres? What do you think about those products that that make those claims? Uh, yes and no. That is, you know, actually, I was uh, the editor of a journal that first published the, the three of those four articles that looked at human studies with TA65. In this case, estrogenol and, and other related compounds. compounds. Um, and it is quite clear that you can, uh, for example, reset immune function. That doesn't mean you go from age 70 to age 30, but there's clearly a difference in that. Um, so the, the part of the problem is it's expensive. I mean, if you're going to one of yeah. the high end where you're pretty reliable, you're probably spending $400 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other sites where you can get it for less. The question is, are you getting what you're paying for? 
not mm-hmm. clear to me. Hard, mm-hmm. hard to assess that. Um, so when people make those claims, you know, I know that there's data that suggests that it has an effect. Um, and the, the question is, how much effect? I don't know. Is it worth the money? It depends where you get it and how much money you have and how old you are. I sometimes joke that, you know, it, if you're rich and you're 20, there's no business taking it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're 80 and you're rich, clearly there's there's a benefit to this, or at least there's a um, potential right. benefit. It's worth yeah. it. If yeah. you're, and if you're 80 and you're only making $20 a month, you'd be lucky to be able to get a roof over your head and an umbrella, let alone be able to afford TS-65. Yeah. Again, there are other sources of estrogenol on the internet. The question is, what are you getting? I don't know. Yeah. What about all those different stem cells uh, th- therapies and th- that are out there now? Well, let's take an example of, say, the knee. And you're looking at your, your chondrocytes in your knee. And the idea is you might be able to take, here's your, your aging knee. It's got osteoarthritis. And we're going to put in new chondrocytes, new stem cells in the knee, <clears throat> which is one way to do it. And it may or may not be effective. What we're suggesting is you take the chondrocytes you've got and reset them. So rather than adding stem cells, you just reset the cells you've got so that they mm-hmm. act like a young knee again. That's probably doable. Here's another example of that, that you know, people look at senolytics in the knee, for example, again. Mm-hmm. And what they're saying is, listen, you've got a bunch of old cells in your knee. Let's remove them so they're not causing trouble. Um, the problem is when you do that, you're left with the remaining cells that have to now divide to make up for the ones you've taken out. So you're aging them faster. So the uh-huh. data, if you look at it carefully in the animal data, it suggests you're getting a honeymoon period where things get better for a while because you remove the offending cells, but then things get worse again at a more rapid, more rapid aging, get worse again. Um, so I don't think senolytics are the are going to pan out. Uh, I don't think stem cells are necessary. I think what we do is take the cells you've got and just reset them. That is reverse aging. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, you know, there, there's that popular product I think it's just called Qualia. That's supposed to be a senolytic. I think it's called Qualia. Or Qualia. You know, they advertise it all around. Uh, you don't think that's probably not worth taking, huh? Well, it depends on how long the honeymoon period is. Oh, uh, yeah. If 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 you're going to live for the next uh, year and you've got a honeymoon period of two years. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, or, or, you know, so it sort of depends. And there's so much yeah. we don't know about the honeymoon period and about the long-term risks of senolytics. Mm-hmm. In principle... It's got problems if you understand the basic physiology, because as I say, in the long run, you're accelerating the aging process. Yeah, that's, that's 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 so amazing, you know, it's so interesting. Yeah, so so it's it's, it's so you, what you guys are really working on is is resetting gene expression. Is is that right? right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're not changing the genes; we're just resetting the gene expression, telling it to play Mozart, not John Cage. No offense to John Cage, but. Not <laughs> So telomerase, a telomerase is that is, is that is it, that's a gene? Is that what that is? Well, there actually it, telomerase is a is an enzyme. There are two parts of it. There's what it's an enzyme. Call the the dye part that stamps out more telomerase units, and there's the active enzyme part that tells it to do that. So they go together. So to say that there's one gene is sort of a misnomer. Um, the the active part is sort of the rate limiting step. So if we use what's called H tert as opposed to HTER and other abbreviations, um, that's probably sufficient uh, to reset aging in human beings. And again, that's what we see in human cells, and that's what we see in human tissues, and that's what we see in animals. So we'll take it to human trials and see what we see. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Well, I am I'm, I'm wish you guys a good success, and I'm going to stay in tune to see what you guys find out. I also want to ask you, you know, from the study of epigenetics, we know that our our genes can actually actually be uh, uh, stimulated and, and and actually affected by our external and our internal environments. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, let me give you a, another example of this one. <clears throat> there have been a lot of studies that purport to show that if you, for example, take a person and measure their their telomere lengths in their peripheral white cells, their leukocytes, <clears throat> and then you uh, for example, put them on a vegetarian diet, have them meditate, like my little Japanese tea house in the background, mm-hmm. um, uh, and you know, do anything you can to improve their lives, um, that in fact, telomeres get longer. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem is that your peripheral telomere links in those white cells respond to almost anything stressful. 
So if you get fired from your job, your dog gets killed, your wife divorces you, you have a viral infection, you're exposed to radiation, all those things um, are stresses. Mm -hmm. And they simply increase the peripheral turnover rate of your white cells. So uh, what these studies actually are, suggest are showing probably is that all you're doing is lower the stress so that the peripheral churning of the white cells is turned down so you're not aging as fast when you're just measuring peripheral white cells. But that tells you nothing about the stem cell uh, niche back in the marrow that's producing these white cells. And it certainly doesn't tell you what's going on in your brain, coronary arteries, kidneys, skin, and uh, so forth. Yeah. 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 Um, so what I'm getting at, though, is that almost anything that increases cell turnover, uh, any stress, physiologic stress, including a hammer, you know, will will increase your, your aging rate. That's mm -hmm. why people who get exposed to a lot of ultraviolet have faster aging of the skin. If you look at basketball players are jumping up and down, they're faster aging of their knees. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's reflected in the telomere links and the gene expression, the genetics of the cells involved. Um, the same thing is true of any, any other part of your body you look at. And whether it's your lungs or whether it's your coronary arteries or whether it's your brain, uh, you know, head injuries, for example, mm -hmm. are going to accelerate aging within the brain, which is why you see rugby players and football players having, a, 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 you know, an earlier incidence of Alzheimer's yeah. and other age-related central nervous system diseases. Yeah. So again, though, I think anything that you can you can do to reduce stress is it's going to be helpful. Any kind yeah. of lifestyle, lifestyle changes, yeah. Doesn't reverse aging, but yeah. it slow it down. Yeah, and make you feel better too, <laughs> especially yeah. mentally. Yeah. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. It's a lot of it's attitude, isn't it, Rico? It's really attitude. You know, uh, you know, you know what I teach. You know, what I call the ageless living lifestyle. It's a mind, body, and spiritual wellness mm -hmm. system and and the biggest factor is really your mindset what you think you know because as you know you, you know what 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 goes what what manifests in our physical body begins in our mental emotional state so that's it's so important you know to get a lot more handle on on your mindset and I, that's the biggest factor and 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 being staying more healthy if, if you don't again like we talked to the very first if you buy into the to the mainstream narrative that that's just the way it is. We're all going to get old and sick and maybe end up in a nursing home and die at about 75. Well, that's probably what you're going to create, right? Yeah. I, you know, one, you can slow it down. And two, if we're right, you can turn it back. Yeah. That's so good. Slow it down and turn it back. Well, okay. Well, I'm, I'm working on slowing it down and you're working on turning it back. So that's good. <laughs> I like you're that a lot. You're my partner, Rico. Absolutely. Yeah. So such an interesting topic. Yeah. Again, I really appreciate the work you're doing. So I want to let people know too, that you have two really good books. One's called Reversing Human Aging. We have more and also the Telemarie's Revolution. Well, that and, Reversing uh, Human Aging came out almost 30 years ago, 28 years ago. Really? Wow. That got me giving the NIH talk and others around the world. And then in between there is a textbook called Cells Aging and Human Disease for Oxygen oh, yeah. Press. Oh, yeah. And then the Telomerase Revolution was the one that came out now about 10 years ago. Um, and nine, I guess. Yeah, nine years ago. Yeah. Um, and and that was a lot more readable. Like the first one, Reversing Human Aging, it's meant for the general public, not for, for physicians. And then there's the new one that you mentioned about aging. And again, that's a more technical book. And then I've got another one that I've been asked to to put out in a couple of years, too. That'd be good. And, and you can find those as, for someone who would like to get a copy of your books. You can find them on your site, on, on telesite.com. Is that where they are? They, they may be. There may be a reference to them. I, I, you know, I would do the same thing everybody else does besides Google. I go to Amazon. It doesn't mean you have to buy it from Amazon, but it's a good place to find things. You, you can find them on Amazon. All right. So, so we'll put those those titles and we'll put that stuff on on, on the show notes. So if people want to learn more and really get into it, I highly recommend you do that. So, uh, well, before we wrap this up, I'd like to get you an idea of maybe give me – Give me your, your top three things that you think that people could do right now just on their own to slow and maybe even implement, begin to start the reversing the aging process. All right, but with two caveats. The first is that the advice <laughs> I give is probably not very sexy. It's probably the same <laughs> advice that your grandmother gave you and your physician gave you and yeah. your grandmother cost less and you didn't do the advice on either one of them. You yeah, see, you know, <laughs> that's so true. So the true. Second, so the second true. one is that if, if I could prove to you, Rico, and to everybody, if I could prove that you could live twice your normal lifespan and stay totally healthy by being locked in the basement in the dark, never talking to anybody <laughs> and eating cardboard, 
yeah. you wouldn't do it because no. there are more important things in life. So, you know, right. let's say that I could prove to you that you live an extra two days by never eating chocolate. Yeah. It's <laughs> not yeah. worth it, you know, or whatever it is your favorite food might be. Yeah. So, or, or for that matter, exercise. You know, exercise is probably good for us. Doesn't mean that you want to do it. You have to sort of balance one sort of happiness with another sort of happiness. Right. So, I mean, the usual advice remains, you know, eat right, whatever that is. There are no good foods and bad foods so much. There's some barely bad foods like cyanide, but yeah. you know, there are no good foods and bad foods. It's a matter of balance and, and how you put them together and whether they make you happy. There's exercise, same sort of problem. You can over-exercise and ruin your knees yeah. or have a heart problem and you can under-exercise yeah. and you can meditate again. You can do lots of things. Um, in fact, if people used to ask me, what's the best way to increase your lifespan? I said, fasten your seatbelt. It, it yeah. doesn't make you younger, but you're going to live longer. Um, but none of that advice is sexy. You know, yeah. you can think about your microbiome. You can think about your exposure to radiation. You can think about whether you're stressed. Uh, another way to avoid life, you know, uh, uh, avoid aging too fast or, or dying too young is to avoid people with loaded weapons. All right, true. But yeah. I think you know that. And none of that advice is sexy. Exercise, diet, all of those things are almost certainly true. Sleep, yeah. Sleep, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, a good social interactive environment. Um, although it's probably true that you'd live longer if you lived in, in the Arctic with polar bears than most human beings, but still in all, we have certain social needs and most of us do better, I think, when we have, um, how do I put this? Pleasant human interactions. Yeah. And, and I, I can think of a lot of people I'd rather not interact with because they're very <laughs> important. But, but in general, but none of that's, again, none of that's something that we don't know. I think everyone out there knows this. That doesn't mean that you do these things. And there's yeah. a lot of nonsense too. You know, yeah. a lot of diets, you pick your diet and it's the diet of the of the year. Um, and a lot of them are no more than lemming behavior. Uh, there are all sorts of suggestions. You should drink seven liters of water a day, seven yeah. glasses. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I, there are a lot of things that you hear out there that are poorly supported. Even the exercise data, almost, almost, not all, but almost all the exercise data <clears throat> suggests that people who exercise more live longer. And have fewer cancers, but that may be because people who exercise more have good genes and they feel better exercising and they're less likely to get cancer because they have good genes mm -hmm. and the other people just have bad luck. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. And I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying a lot of the studies out there don't really look at whether exercise helps. They just notice the correlation and correlations are really poor. It's like one of the correlations I know is that people who, if you really want to lower your incidence of heart disease by infant diapers, because people who buy <laughs> infant diapers tend not to get heart attacks. But that's because people who buy infant diapers are 25 years old with kids. They're not <laughs> years, you know what I mean? Yeah. It has, it's no protective, you know, protective factor there. So a lot of what we know about diet and exercise falls into the trash category. I still think a good diet and exercise are great. Yeah. I just know that a lot of the data out there is in the buy diapers category, namely. <laughs> nonsense. Yeah. Well, I think what it comes down to, doesn't it, Michael? It's it's all about balance. It's all about having a balanced life because that that's what the universe is about balance, right? The middle way, you know, right? Yeah, but stay in, stay in balance. Any extremes no, are no not good. Moderation, right? Yeah, even, even moderation should be taken in moderation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even that's a good one. I've never heard that before. I like that. Even moderation should be moderated. Yeah, yeah. It's all about balance, and and, and that's that's really what. Disease in the body it means the body's not at ease. It's not in balance, and, and, and when you do the best you can to get your body back in balance, then the body can heal itself. And so it's always about balance and not. And, and we can see that in nature too. Any extremes in nature are harmful, right? But when things are more balanced and more metal, things work out really better. So I think that's the best thing that we, can, we focus on is, is just staying in balance, both mentally and physically. Good. Yeah, yeah. Good to me. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound good to you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, let me see. Do I have anything else I want? I'm sure I'll think of some things I wish I would have asked you. And, uh, well, but, let me but, say say one thing to be clear about all of this stuff. Sure. Which is, you know, as I used to say to my residents and my graduate students, a good theory that's consistent with all known clinical and laboratory data and that's predictably valid is excellent. But data wins every time. So we think we understand now, at least enough. Uh, how to reverse aging in people and therefore Alzheimer's and coronary artery disease and, and chronic renal failure. We think we can do that. But until we actually try it, it's no more than 30. 
Yeah. So we'll see what yeah. the data shows. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. It's one of the reasons we we tend to avoid awards and conferences and, and TED talks. Yeah. No, yeah. Let, let the data speak for itself. Yeah. That's so good. Well, again, I, I well, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for your good work that you're doing. And I definitely want to stay connected and see what's coming up and what you learn. And it's, it's just fascinating information. And uh, it's what makes life really interesting, isn't it? To, to see what we can learn and discover and how we can advance ourselves. It, that's just that's what keeps me motivated. Hey, let me actually, for a moment, put this in a historical perspective, too. If, if you said to me, what is the most important single thing we've ever done in human history to improve life, to improve human lives? The answer was not a technical advance. It wasn't robotic surgery or second generation or fifth generation cephalosporins or heart transplants. That wasn't it. It was a conceptual revolution. And that was microbial theory. Over mm -hmm. the past two centuries, we've gone from it just happens and maybe it's evil spirits to... <laughs> You know, it's a fungus, it's a E. coli, it's a yeah. staph. We begin to understand microbial disease. And the upshot of that was not only that we improved the human lifespan and, and human health, uh, but we drastically and drastically cut, for example, neonatal and maternal death rates at delivery because you wash your hands. Yeah, sanitation. It's really it sanitation, was, right? Yeah. It was. But, but the out, upshot of that is we not only improved life, but we lowered the cost of medical care. Instead of having people dying of purple fever after they deliver the baby that died, we're saving lives. And, and in so doing, we're actually saving money as well. We've lowered the cost of, of medical care. Most technical advances, whatever they are, tend to increase the cost of medical care. And the question is, are they worth it? But the conceptual advance of microbial theory lowered the cost of medical care globally, personally, nationally. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're about to do the same thing that we did for microbial theory with understanding aging. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is show that we can actually lower the cost of medical care for Alzheimer's, coronary artery disease, osteoarthrosis, osteoporosis, you name it. Yeah. Not increase it, but lower the cost of medical care and improve human lives. Yeah, that's so good, Michael. You know, I, I, I like to end all my podcasts with Einstein's famous saying that, you know, knowledge without action is useless. So I always want to encourage our audience to take action. So I think what we learned from, and what I learned from you is is is, is you got to get get yourself educated and not just buy in. Like I said, like as we mentioned, don't don't just buy into the mainstream that that's just the way it is. We're, we're all going to get old or we're going to age and get nothing we can do about it. That's not true. So, you know, explore and learn and discover and see what works for you and stay up on what people like you are doing and uh, you can definitely enhance your life. So you got to take action, right? As I used to say to my patients, you know, don't listen to me, listen to your body. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, absolutely what your body's talking to you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Michael Fossil, thank you so much for being here. I really enjoy that. And again, I want to thank you for your the great work that you're doing. Rico, it's been an honor and a pleasure. <laughs> All right. I'll take that. That sounds good. All right. So thanks, my friend. Yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks for to our audience. And like we always say. Take some action on what you learned today and go out and make it happen and make it a better world. Thanks to everybody. Let's see, where's pause?